So we're going to talk some about um, simulator design, and we said this is what chapter in our textbook? 21. 21. So really, uh, CT simulation. Um, we'll describe the components of computed tomography um, as it relates to simulation. Um, we'll, use, we'll define some acronyms that we use pretty frequently. We'll outline those steps of the simulation process. I have, a, I have a question. Shoot. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, she gave us simulator design, and you gave us simulator design. Do all your PowerPoints cover everything that she gave you? I don't know what she gave you. It's, it's, it's a public on the book. Um, I guess the main question is, does yours cover everything that we need to know for the test? Yes. Okay, so, okay. That's what we need. Really hers are a lot longer. It is. Yeah. It's, it's just, the she's, focus she's, of me comes straight from the book. From uh, the I think I looked at that last year and pulled out what I felt like was the big takeaways. Okay. There's a lot of, sometimes a lot of times when textbook companies give us PowerPoints, they over, like I can't lecture for that long, and as a student I can't listen for that long. So I try to just pull out what is absolute, absolutely relevant in the places of confusion. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like the okay. surface anatomy PowerPoint is like 270 yeah. pages. That's crazy. And it, it, yeah, that's crazy. It, I guess that's helpful maybe as a student if you digest things that way, but that's not how I learn. I, I like lectures to be pretty short and sweet and to tell me this is what we're doing, okay. right? That's helpful. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. So um, acronyms are going to be important. Probably the number one takeaway here is this guy, Mr. Houndsfield. So um, that's going to be very significant for us, so don't fall asleep for that part. Um, and we'll make sure that we've defined these key terms as best as possible. Good question. Though. So um, we've already looked a little bit at the construction of the CT X-ray tube. Um, uh, I would encourage you to um, familiarize with yourself with this illustration. Uh, I think it's very helpful. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it comes from your textbook or not, but I can't remember where I found this illustration, but it's, I think it's my favorite illustration of the x-ray tube. We have a tungsten anode right here with a mol uh, molybdenum neck and base. So um, very high Z number in the tungsten. And we're going to negatively charge this cathode and accelerate electrons. So this is an electron beam. Accelerate electrons towards that target, and that's what's going to produce the x-ray beam. We cause this anode to rotate, so it has a stator which just stays there and pulses electromagnetic energy to cause this uh, rotor to rotate. So but the ones that are most helpful to be able to identify here is tungsten anode, the glass envelope, the filament circuit, and the filament itself, the electron beam, this molybdenum neck, and then I would remember this as the rotor and stator. The rotor rotates and the stator just stays there. Let's give ourselves a little bit of context here. Um, if you ever want to watch an interesting YouTube video, you could plug this into YouTube. It gives you a brief history of CT. Um, so it's produced by EMI. And it shows you the very first CT scan. This CT scanner um, is an old lathe table that has an Americanium source right here and a single detector right there. And that right there, that cube, is a cow's brain preserved in formaldehyde. So this was some pretty weird stuff that they were playing around with. Um, they would go to the kosher slaughterhouses around London um, and harvest the cow's brain from the kosher slaughterhouses because according to kosher law, they had to leave the brain intact during slaughtering. And so they would bring these back to EMI and put them on this lathe until they were starting to decay. And they would use a radioactive source to try to figure out how um, the mathematics worked for CT computation. The man who did that, his name's uh, Jeffrey Hounsfield. And this is an early example of how the computation works. So, there would be a single um, amount of information acquired in this direction. Then we would rotate the cow's brain, and we would get a slightly different set of information, rotate it some more and get different sets of information. 
and we would start to then decompose all those different data sets into a single view. Right? So that is how computed tomography works. Um, this was largely, and our textbook points this out, a lot of the funding for this came from Beatlemania, the Beatles, right? Components of a CT uh, machine that are helpful for us to be able to identify um, are the gantry itself, which is this large donut-shaped portion. Most of the time, patients do not see the gantry, they see a gantry cover. If you saw the actual gantry and it was rotating, you would be terrified. It looks very scary when it's moving. It moves very fast, right? So this entire um, assembly is on slip rings, which allow us to uh, power it with a kilovolt level power, and it still can rotate at the same time, right? That was developed, that technology came from NASA. So slip ring technology allowed us to power the CT gantry for rotation during image acquisition. Right here we have a T that indicates the tube. So that is where the x-ray tube is situated. Is right there. You can actually see kind of the back part of the x-ray tube. And then this section D here is a detector. And so this whole bank here is a bank of detectors. So people will talk about different slice CT scanners, like 16 slice or 64 slice or what have you. That is referring to the amount of detectors that are here in this bank of detectors. Um, the geometry of the x-ray beam is important. So this is probably a cone beam geometry, which is also what we use for image acquisition and radiation therapy. And that just means that the shape of the x-ray beam looks like a cone. Um, this point X here at the center of the gantry, can anyone guess what that point might be called? Isocenter? Mm -hmm. The CT scanner has an isocenter also, um, and it just means the center around which everything rotates. So we would not want to confuse this isocenter with the isocenter of the linear accelerator, but they serve a very similar purpose. And it help, it's helpful for me as I'm setting up the simulation to be mindful of where the ISO center is for the CT scanner as well. Um, these images over here are to kind of familiarize ourselves with how different things look from the point of view of the CT scanner. So this here, this kind of smoke trail image, is what we call a sinogram or a scanogram. Um, this is the actual data set that the CT scanner receives. This is the way the pictures look to the CT scanner. Now that's in, not intelligible to me. I'm not accustomed to looking at a histogram that way. And so I'm going to zoom in on this picture. Our textbook talks about filtered back projection, which is one way that we can get axial images from this data set. So what we do is we use a filtering process that projects the information back onto a matrix and it lays that information out in a way that the human eye can understand. Right? So it is taking this information, it is filtering it and placing it back on a matrix and that matrix aligns with, in this case, an axial image where I can locate, okay, there's a shape that looks like that, a shape that looks like that, a shape that looks like that. If you look very closely, though, in this image, I can see what those shapes look like from the computer's point of view. It's a certain kind of histogram, okay? Is everyone familiar with the term histogram? Okay, it's a, da it's a shape of data pixels. So a histogram is all of these values here represent different pixels in different places. Now, um, one final step uh, here, and, and this is not actually a CT image, this is an MRI image, but I included this MRI image because MRI uses what we call K-space quite a bit. 
Um, this is yet another way that we can um, filter information is we can place it within case space and change its color patterns based off of this case space here. Now, um, I don't want to go too far down a rabbit trail with that, um, but just understand that there are numerous different ways that we can reconstruct information. Okay? Filter back projection is one of the most common ways used in CT. We can use case space <coughs> to change, um, in particular, contrast. So one of the ways that we will be using case space as CT technologists and as therapists is we will use it to change the window level and width. So we're going to look at manipulating window level and window width for CT images because it's a big part of what we do. And just be aware that what we're manipulating there is largely data that's stored in case space. Does your textbook talk about case space? Mm -hmm. No. No? It does. It talks about the window level. And width. Okay. Okay, good. Yeah, I don't know if it goes to quite that depth, but we will be hitting window level and width. So here's some components um, from the, the CT hardware. So within that gantry here, right, we have a bunch of different um, things that are going to help us make the uh, CT image. So let's, uh, let's zoom in on this real quick. So there's that x-ray tube, and I said that it's going to have collimators as well. And the x-rays traversing the patient are in that cone shape, geometry, and then there'll be th this one that says fan x-ray beams, this one looks more like a fan, that's another geometry. What we use primarily is cone now. And then a detector array over here. That detector array changes the x-ray signals that it receives into an analog electronic signal. So a continuous electronic signal is generated by that detector. The computer doesn't think about things from an, an analog point of view. It thinks about things in a digital form of view, right? So we have an ADC, or an analog to digital converter. It takes the analog signal and it converts it to a discrete data set, right? Now, discrete is a fancy term for means it puts a number on everything. So it's not just some fluid shape anymore. This point equals that number. And that number is what we're talking about when we talk about binary. Has everyone heard the term binary? Okay. Binary is the way that computers think. They either think on or off. So us, as humans, we work with what we call base 10. Because I've got 10 fingers on my hand, right? So we count based on 10, 10, 20, 30, 40. Our scientific systems are on base 10. Right? So the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, right? That's base 10. Computers think about things in base 2. It is either on or it is off. That's all a computer knows. It knows on and it knows off. So everything in a computer is built on base 2. Um, so all of this is converted into 1s and zeros, right? It can make any number in base 2. It just looks much different from us, right? So, for example, a 64-slice CT scanner means something in base 2, right? A lot of um, monitor sizes and display sizes and all sorts of things are in base 2. And ultimately, that's sent to a computer in a place where it can be viewed, right? So this computer reconstructs the image from that digital data. There's another way we can look at it, if that seems a little, like a little bit too much. I'll send you all a copy of this illustration. Um, and actually, we'll look at it again in CT. Um, but all of these different things are located here within this schematic drawing, which is one of the reasons I like this drawing. And so um, if we look right here, there is isocenter right? That little tiny red X right there is the isocenter of the gantry. So what would this right here be? Okay. 
Mm -hmm. There's our x-ray tube. So if that's the x-ray tube, what is this right here? Close. This is, I'll, I'll show you the beam. Yes, that's the detector array. So there's the beam in blue. Do I need to zoom in or can y'all see that? Is it too small? Zoom in a little okay. bit. Would be more okay. 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 So, um, So if, if that is, the, what is this portion right here, what we call this? The field? The gantry. The gantry. Yep, that's our gantry, right? And the information from the detectors is fed into this thing right here. So what would this be right here? So it comes out as an analog signal. comes out of the detector as an analog signal. How do we get it into a digital signal? The ADC. Good. The ADC is right here. All right. That feeds that information back into these processes here. So we'll reformat it, reconstruct it, and then we can display it. Okay? So this is, this is just like the motherboard here. Kind of central processing unit. Um, don't worry too much about the other things on this illustration. We'll come back to it. I want us to have a very simple understanding of what we're doing. In this is that are you okay with that? Okay, because I want to focus us on some stuff that directly bears to radiation therapy. Okay, there is also a software component to CT, and so it's important to kind of orient ourselves to how the software works. Um, like I alluded to, CT thinks in, it, it's using com computers to perform tomograms, which tomogram is Greek for just slices. So the very first CT scanners performed uh, something in a slice-wise manner. And so you can see here, we used to explain to patients, we're going to make slices almost like a loaf of bread, and we'll able to look at the body slice by slice, so we can pull out a slice in the middle of the loaf of bread, and see, oh, there's a frog, right? So slice by slice by slice, we can move through this loaf of bread, right? Um, that is why originally CT was called CAT scan, right? Does anyone ever hear it referred to as a CAT scan? That means computed axial tomography. So axial is just slice by slice by slice, computed axial tomography. We now call it CT, computed tomography, because we might do a different kind of slice, something more like a honey-baked ham. Has anyone ever seen a honey-baked ham? How do they describe those hams? Spiral cut. Spiral cut. So this right here is what we call helical. This is a spiral slice. So just like with the honey-baked ham or like a slinky, it is a single continuous volume of data. That's very helpful. A lot of things in nature have this form. In fact, pine cones have a helical um, slice orientation. If you turn a pine cone around, it has a helical way that um, the, the pine cone bristles are situated. And there's a lot of flowers and all sorts of things in nature that have this helical form. And so it's more, I, I like to think about it as more, being more true to life, the helical way. Um, so, for example, a slinky has a helical um, orientation. And the nice thing about this is I can put it together and I have a unified 3D shape which we said is what we're shooting for when we do simulation. We want to make a 3D model of the patient, right? Versus if I have um, uh, this, like a bunch of pepperonis stacked up, I, if, uh, they would always, no matter how I had a bunch of pepperonis, I could never quite have a unified 3D set of pepperonis, right? They would always kind of have funny edges to them. The same is true with data that we would acquire axially. 
So I want to do something. I want to show you all this, and I hope you never forget this. We do not do this at all in therapy. There's no point of the axial acquisition. It's important for you to know that because the scanners still have the capability to do axial. What we are after is purely a helical data set. Okay. Um, within that data set, I pointed out, I said earlier that there are pixels and voxels. So if I zoom in here, a pixel is a picture element. So it's a single two-dimensional picture element. So a pixel has an X and a Y. Right? And within that X and that Y, there's either a 1 or a 0. Right? 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. That's how the images are formed. Okay? Largely what we work with in CT, though, is what we call a voxel. And that has an X, Y, and Z, just like the machine itself. And this is what we use also for therapy treatment. So within this cube now, there is a 1 or a 0, right? Okay, let's review some acronyms that are helpful. Um... PAX means Picture Archiving Computer System. And I'm not going to test you on like what the actual acronym stands for, but you need to know that this is a server where, where images reside. It's where the pictures live. Um, so it would be an archive of digital images. They are stored in a specific format, which is DICOM. DICOM is just like JPEG or Bitmap or any of the other formats that you're accustomed to using like your phone camera. Those are just different image formats. DICOM is particularly helpful for storage of medical data because it has a lot of different um, meta tags that we can place on it. So it's a larger image format and it's readily understood throughout the world as uh, related to medical imaging, particularly uh, x-ray images. So DICOM is a format. It means digital um, imaging communications and medicine or something like that. Um, again, I'm not interested in you memorizing what the acronym stands for. What I am interested in is, is that this is a format that the images are communicated in. HL7 is a format that the machines use to communicate with each other. So it means health level 7. So, the so I've got a patient who shows up for their simulation. The um, person types that into EPIC or whatever my patient registration software is in. That information is then communicated to the CT scanner or to their EEG machine or to the linear accelerator in HL7. So if there's a problem with the HL7 connection, I might have all the patient's information in the system, but they can't get it to my CT scanner. That's HL7. An H, an H, a hiss, we talk about hisses and risses. A hiss or a riss is a health information system. Riss is a radiology information system. This is where largely orders reside. So if a patient has an order or a test is done, and they had an order for blood work, we would look up that information in the HIS. Now the umbrella where the HIS resides is the EMR. The EMR is not just a HIS. The EMR has, like the EPIC is the EMR that they use at that Baptist. So that is one brand of EMR, electronic medical record system. It contains everything. It has the hiss, it has a wrist, it has um, probably access to a PAX. Um, it has whatever weird, I think in EPIC, the risk for radiation oncology is called radiant. So it has a separate risk for radiant. It has billing software, right? It has everything is in that EMR. Okay, so it is the umbrella term. One other acronym that we use occasionally is VSIM. 
This may mean virtual SIM or verification SIM, depending on who you're talking to. And when I think about a virtual SIM, I think about what the dosimetrists are doing, that they're setting up something and they're, they're planning out a treatment just with, using a computer, just using a computer. If it's a verification SIM, if they're saying, okay, we need to have a V-SIM tomorrow for the patient, if the patient needs to be involved, that's a verification SIM. So now what we're doing is we're taking that model of data that we created in the treatment plan, and we're going to just play that out on the treatment machine and make sure everything lines up the way that we want it to. We might do a treatment, we might not. Algorithm is a one more fancy word. It just means a recipe. But it means specifically a recipe with a stop. It has a specific starting point and a, a specific ending point. So, for example, an algorithm that we looked at earlier is the algorithm of moving from producing x-rays with an x-ray tube to producing images on a CT display system, right? So all of these steps by steps by steps wind up with a stop. I have a picture now, right? I can get the patient up off the table, we're done. All right, let's talk about Hounsfield units. So this is the part I said that we need to pay attention in. Okay. So with his weird, crazy experimentation using cow brains and um, Beatles records or whatever else he was doing to create the model for CT scanning, um, so Jeffrey Hounsfield created what he called the Hounsfield unit, right? It is a scale that relates attenuation within the body to do different numerical values. So that's helpful, right? Because I need to convert an analog signal to a digital signal. And I said that digital just means like digits, numbers, right? So I need to be able to convert the different attenuation values of structures inside the patient's body into numbers. That's the name of the game. So, for example, your nose has a different attenuation value from your teeth, and your teeth have a different attenuation value from your tongue, and your tongue has a different attenuation value from your spine. All of those things might be on a single CT image. Every single one of them attenuates x-rays differently. Do you get what I'm saying? They attenuate x-rays differently. So I want to be able to tie that potential for the tissues to attenuate x-rays to a numerical value. That is what the Hounsfield scale does. The center, or the zero point for Hounsfield, I wonder if anyone can guess what it might be. So we said that earlier when we were setting up for SIMS, we want things to be quick, reliable, and economic. So if we had to build, if we need to use some part of the natural world to measure, and we want this to be our zero point, something that's cheap, something that exists in the body, something that is easy to find, what might we use? Awesome. Water is the zero point for the Hounsfield scale. Good job. So zero equals water, right? We can get water phantoms all over the place. And they, to this day, even when they're setting up for linear accelerator, uh, you've seen water phantoms? Good. Um, so zero is water. Water is also the most plentiful mo molecule in the body, right? So we knew that any attenuation value greater than water is going to show up white. So what might be the whitest white thing that we would expect to see on this scale? Bone. Awesome. So bone will show up very white. Right? Anything that's less than water will show up dark or black. So what would that be? What's something that might be very dark, like black? Good. Air. Now I want to point out, with the iodine, so let's locate that on our scale. 
We said that iodine is a positive contrast agent. So where would we expect it to fall on this? More towards the bone side. So iodine might be right here. Here might be my IV contrast and my barium, right? I could write barium up there too. I just I write like a five-year-old using the stylus. Um, but I said that negative contrasts show up black. So air is definitely a negative contrast. It's the most commonly used negative contrast, right? Because we breathe in all the time. Um, now, there is one little funky thing that shows up in this area. Something that's, that floats on water, right? That's part of your body. Can you ever think about what's something that floats on water, part of tissue of your body? Pretty, a pretty, oh, they say us in America have a lot of it. Fat is lighter than water, so it floats on water, so therefore it's going to show up darker on the Hounsfield scale. So anything that's adipose tissue shows up. And so within this, we also have, you ever heard the term fathead, right? Like little kids calling each other bad names on the playground or something. Well, our, our heads do have more fat in them. You can tell the bully on the playground, that's true. My head has more fat in it. Because the brain is myelinated, and myelin is a form of fat. So the brain shows up. This is where we get uh, like white matter and gray matter in the brain. The gray matter has more fat in it, right? Um, so, uh, on this side, maybe just shy of that, we might have something like blood, right? So blood and water are pretty close to each other, right? But blood is a little bit more dense than water. It's got some stuff floating around in it. So you can see, here's the reason why we might want to use IV contrast. We want to be able to differentiate, is that a blood vessel feeding a tumor or is that something else. So we introduce IV contrast, we can see it's going to change its attenuation value, so it will change its Hounsfield unit as well. Okay? So um, just so you know, on the scale, it is like a number line where anything less than zero is negative, anything greater than zero is positive. So over here on the far side with air, we would have something close to negative 1,000, and over here close to bone, we have something close to positive. 1,000. That is the range of the Hounsfield scale, is it's 2,000 units of range from negative 1,000 to positive 1,000. Okay? And I'm not necessarily interested in you memorizing what the actual values are for blood. We'll, we'll have plenty of time to do that in CT, but right now I want you to be able to look at a Hounsfield scale and say, this is where blood would be. I would expect it to be in this area right here on the Hounsfield scale, right? This is where I would expect fat to be, is somewhere over here lighter than water. Are you tracking with me? Okay. Good. So the reason I stress the Hounsfield scale so much is because windowing and leveling is a huge part of our jobs. You've probably seen, if you've been to a clinical site yet, you've probably seen people windowing and leveling all day long who may or may not be able to tell you anything about the Hounsfield scale, right? But the principle of windowing and leveling or adjusting contrast on the image is one of the powers of using computers to create digital images is they have a tremendous amount of contrast depth, right? So we call that their dynamic range. You don't need to write that down. But they have a wide range of contrast that they can capture. So anything from negative 1,000 to positive 1,000 can show up on this uh, range of units that we've created with the Hounsfield scale. And so the level that we're looking at, we'll refer to as, again, the level. You know, we didn't want to call it anything too complicated. So right now, it looks like if this is the Hounsfield scale, I have a level that's centered on what? Zero. Yeah, zero. So I might say the level here is zero. L is zero, right? The width is the range of values around zero 
that I'm representing on my image. So anything greater than the window width in this direction is going to show up just pitch black. And anything greater than the window width in this direction is going to show up just white. Right? So it is the range of values um, from that will show up as gray. So the window width controls the range of values that shows up as gray. We could guess what the window width is, but one thing I want to point out is, let's say that the window width in this case is 100. Let's just say that that's the case. So if the window level is set at zero, what is this number right here if the window width is 100? Negative 50, good. And over here, it would be positive 50. You tracking with me? So this is a width of 100. Everything between those attenuation values of negative 50 and positive 50 will show up as some range of gray, right? So one way that students like to think about window width and window level is window level controls the black and the white. Window level controls the black and the white. Window width controls all of the gray. I think that's the easiest way to remember it. So if my width is really, really wide, I'm going to have a whole lot of gray. If it's really, really narrow, I, that will be high contrast, and I will not have that much gray in it. We want to find an optimal range. We want somewhere we're going to kind of be playing with the images in order to find an optimum range of contrast to see what we need to see. So we may need to change the level. If, something what, I'm, if what I'm looking for is closer to fat or air, I might need to have the window level be lower. So what would be an area of the body where we would want to use a window level less than zero? Thorax, particularly to see what? Awesome. Good. So, um, if I see an image that where I can see fine details within the lung, chances are the window level is set to something less than zero. Right? For most of what we do in CT scanning, though, the window level is greater than zero. So, lungs are the one funky looking one. The rest of what we do, the window level is greater than zero, and we will change the width depending on what we want to see. So here is just another slide explaining that other, uh, everything I pretty much just told you, just kind of hammered out a little bit more in detail. So we'll pause here. Okay. Let's, let's test some of our learning related to what we just saw, okay? So for this right here, if we changed from this image here to this image here, how did we change these pictures? We increased the width. Good. It looks like we increased the width. We did not change the level. I can't see more lung markings here but I see more gray. This looks fairly high contrast, like the stomach contents really pop compared to the liver. Over here, the stomach contents don't pop quite as much, but I'm able to see more shades of gray. So I changed the window width, I made the window width larger. Good. All right, now we're looking at the level. What level are we at here? Transverse in what part of the patient's anatomy? Head and neck. Good, head and neck. So this looks like part of the mandible, the jaw. What is this, you think? This thing here. What is that? Does the patient have a fan in their mouth? Possibly. I think it's probably a gold tooth. Oh. Right? So I've got a metal streak artifact coming off the metal, and, and I can't see very clearly around the metal that's in their tooth on this image right here, right? 
So what does it look like I did? I, how did I change that so that I could see a little bit better in here around the gold tube? You expanded the window. Good. Again, this is a change in the window width. I went from high contrast here, and actually I can see IV contrast in the carotids here. This is a helpful view for looking at the carotids, but not so helpful for looking at the tongue. So I may have increased the window width without changing the level in order to see soft tissue around that metal artifact. Okay, now what changed here though, Ms. Rudd? The uh, Level. So I've gone from a negative level image to a positive level, primarily. That's the primary. That's what I meant to say. Yeah, I figured you, yeah, I, I was with you. Okay, last little thing is to talk about some artifacts. I think our textbook does talk about artifacts, doesn't it? Or does it not? So the level, it like makes, it can change how, like, how much detail you see. Both of them are changing detail, how much detail is seen. Okay. We're trying to just suit the anatomy of interest. One of the better, if you, if you want to think about it from the detail point of view, it's kind of an, it's an upside down way of thinking about things, but think if, if I have a, a high subject contrast, I probably want a low image contrast because I'm going to be, be a, a better able to see the details that I want to see there. Versus if I have a low subject contrast, I will probably want a high image contrast because, again, then I'll be able to see the details I need to see. So it's kind of an opposite game. That was a good question. Other questions? It's helpful for me to hear what y'all are thinking. Um, I do want to point out that we do fight artifacts some uh, as we're getting images. This is a, what we call a ring artifact. So this is a water phantom. This should be uniform in shape. The entire Hounsfield unit measurement should be zero across it. But you can see that we've got some kind of calibration error with our scanner. It's making it appear to have ripples inside the water that are not actually there. This is what we call an out-of-field artifact. Out-of-field artifact. And actually, these, pa these images right here are on the same patient at the same level. Can anyone guess what might be outside of the scan field of view that would be causing this artifact, the streaking? Change in level? Hmm? Uh, is it causing the streaking? Yeah, what's causing the streaking? I'll give you a hint. It's part of the patient's body. Here's my hint. Their arms. Their arms are down. So the bones in their arms are outside of the scan field of view, and so it is causing a streak artifact across the image. It, it, the computer can't, it, it can't recognize what's causing that change in attenuation. So I have the patient raise their arms, and I have a much clearer picture. Something to be aware of, because we need to be thinking about that when we're setting someone up for simulation, right? Are we going to be treating them with their arms up or arms down? If we're treating them with their arms down, how does that affect what the CT scanner can do? Because planning a treatment on this can be a lot harder than planning a treatment on that. Okay. Um, similar to that metal artifact that we saw earlier, this is what we would call beam hardening or bone artifact. At the base of the skull, there's a lot of very dense bone, so in the temporal bone. And so we get a funny streak artifact right here across the cerebellum or the midbrain caused by bone. There's no way to remove that. We just have to window around it. This is a windmill artifact. Um, your book goes into quite a bit of detail about pitch and some technical values that we will talk about more when we get into CT. But just know that this is an error that most machines self-correct for related to having a pitch that exceeds the area that we're scanning. What we call it a windmill artifact. This is probably the creepiest artifact of them all. Um, this is what we call a gradient edge. Gradient edge. Um, 
so we've got a bunch of different weird structures here. We've got the liver. We've got air, it looks like, in the small bowel. Maybe some air in the stomach. Maybe some barium in the stomach. We've got IV contrast in the descending aorta. But right here, where there's this convergence of air, IV contrast, and liver, it looks like it's projected a shadow into the liver, right? So we call that a gradient edge. A gradient is a fancy name for like a spectrum, almost like a rainbow. But generally it's a spectrum of a single color. So you can see that it starts out black here, it gets gray, gray, slightly less gray, slightly less gray, slightly less gray until it's gone. That's a gradient. Right? They're used in advertising all the time. This is an artifact that does not that is not really there in the patient's body. The computer was not sure how to find the edge between the barium here, the air there, and the liver there. It just couldn't detect an edge. So it kind of projected them out. Um, I wouldn't worry terribly about it, but just be aware that it is a kind of artifact concerned with.